Welcome, friends, to this monthly meeting, the satsang meeting that we're having every month. The purpose of this meeting is that we remain on track on our spiritual path. Our minds being what they are, we get so distracted by our daily life, our daily obligations, that we forget the main purpose for which we have a human body. The human body is the only form of life out of specified 8.4 million forms of life on this planet. The human body is the only form of life in which we use what is called free will, the capacity to make a choice, the capacity to make decisions, the capacity to use your mind to think and decide whether to go right or left, whether to do this or not. All these decision makings are possible only in human life. Not all the time, only sometime. We think we can decide things all the time, but if you look at your life, 80% of your life, you had no decision making power. You have no decision making power where you are born. You have no decision making power where you die. No decision making power where you have accidents. No decision making power where you'd meet strangers. No decision making where you'd fall in love with somebody. No decision making. These are things that happen automatically as if there is a pre programmed destiny we are bringing with us when we are born. But the 20% time, which are not these fixed events, we are given options, alternatives to decide. And that is where we use free will. People ask me, is it really free? If you believe in God, then it is not. If you don't believe in God, then it is. Because if you believe in God, the definition of God in all religions, no matter by what name they've called that creative power or God, says God is omnipresent, present everywhere, omnipotent, all the power is, is of the God, and omniscient, knows everything. If God does not know what decision you are going to make, then he is no God. And if he knows what decision you are going to make, then the decision is already made. And you have to go with God's will, God's decision making power. Therefore, if you believe in God, you cannot have free will. The free will is dictated by the will of God. If you are an atheist, then you can say, God doesn't exist. I make my own decisions. Is there a definite way by which you can check this out? What is true? Do we have real free will, which we feel we have right now in the human body, or we don't? It can be validated, checked by a simple process. The process is going to be going within your own self where the decisions are made. Whenever we use free will, we use our mind. We think. It's a thinking process. That is how we make decisions. It's a deliberative process. We deliberate, not merely think. You deliberate the pros and cons. Is, which is better for me? Which do I like more at this time? And you make that decision. People study this human body and the brain and they're very impressed by it. It's a very complex anatomy of this body. How millions and millions of miles of nerves are placed in a very small body. The nervous system is so huge in this, if you stretch them out. The DNA molecule, which is in the center of every cell of this body, is a double coiled, small little piece, compressed to fit in one cell of 
Oh, every, every cell, including a skin cell, has a complete DNA molecule. But the DNA molecule, if we take it out and pull it to see its lengthwise, not the coiled one, not the pressed, compressed one, <laughs> but pull it out to see its length, can stretch almost up to one inch. And that DNA molecule in every cell of ours compacted. Can you imagine? The DNA molecule can predict things like whether you'll be a smoker at age 40 or not. That's what they found out today. Then, uh, is it containing all our destiny? Maybe it is. If the DNA molecule already given to us in our body at birth can contain our whole destiny, how can we have free will? We're just acting as slaves of a DNA molecule. We're just following it. It's very interesting to study the anatomy of the body. Have we studied the anatomy of consciousness? There's a book available <laughs> called The Anatomy of Consciousness. The author is supposed to be one Ishwar Chandrapuri, <laughs> but I didn't write it. My wife wrote it. Of course, she based most of the book on the talks I had given, and they were transcribed, and from the transcription, she put them in the form of a book, but she added some of her own notes also to make it original. Some training she got from a Buddhist teacher, she added that to the book, and some embellished it a little bit, which I'm glad because when I started writing that book many years ago, I could only write one line, the title, Anatomy of Consciousness. And then I said, we are conscious because we are conscious. It's so difficult to understand consciousness because our whole idea of being conscious is being aware. I'm conscious of this, that means I'm aware of it. It presupposes that consciousness is merely a means of experiencing something that already exists. But supposing consciousness does more, that means supposing consciousness creates that which we experience at the same time as we experience. It's a very different definition of consciousness. This debate is not new. Does consciousness only experience what has been created or does consciousness create the experience? Those who think that the subject which consciousness picks up should be pre-existing are called materialists. And a lot of material, materialist scientists, most scientists are materialists. They believe the empirical knowledge comes from studying matter outside, studying what is already there in our sensory experiences. Those who think that maybe all our experiences are merely being generated by consciousness using simple tools like a human mind and sense perceptions working in the mind. If sense perceptions are the only source of our knowledge of what is existing, obviously there is some validity to that argument. Sense perceptions are the power to see, hear, touch, taste, smell. These powers we are using every day to know the whole world. I want to know, is this cup real or is it just my consciousness creating it? I'll say, I can touch it, cold water, taste it. Absolutely real. My experience is absolutely real. How can I say the glass is not real? And yet, if I go to sleep and have a dream and I see the same glass in the dream, and I touch it, and I drink it, the experience will be real. If I wake up, the experience is still real. I still remember, but there will be no glass. How did the glass come in the dream, and I tasted the water, 
but there was no glass. Oh, the dream projected it outside. Why didn't I know that? Because in the dream state, all I knew was that the dream was real. Everything looked real. Even if I found out it's a dream, and sometimes we have dreams where we find out we are dreaming. Supposing I find out it's a dream, I tell my friends, look, I know we are dreaming. When we wake up, there are no friends to tell. Even the statement of the truth does not give you the truth. You're telling a truth. It's a dream. You're not aware of it. We are saying the same thing. Maybe this wakeful state is also a dream. When can we definitely find out that what we saw in a dream was only a dream and not real, created by the mind, when we wake up? Can we find out while we are dreaming? No way. If we find out we are not dreaming, it's called daydreaming. Because then they are also awake to know that. This similarly, if there is a state of wakefulness, higher than this state of wakefulness, which we have risen from a sleep that we have and dream that we have, the higher state of wakefulness alone will tell us if this was also a dream. And all made up by the mind and consciousness. But there is a better way to validate this particular theory, you might say, or this particular explanation of creation, that the creation is just an experience taking place in our mind by projecting everything like we do in a dream. The best part is, if you really want to validate it, go within to the mind and study your mind. Not study outside things, because we are examining whether outside things exist or not, whether mind can produce them. Go within yourself to the mind. Can it be done practically? Yes, certainly. What is preventing us from studying our own mind, which is working in the head? We know that it's working in the head. Because when we think, we know we are thinking in the head, not in our hands, not in our legs or, uh, or limbs, not even in our heart. All thoughts are going on in our head. We can feel them behind the eyes. Therefore, what is preventing us from studying our mind is we are constantly using the main instrument of learning which is paying attention outside. Our attention is captured by outside experiences all the time. We don't go within ourselves at all. We think just a brain, maybe gray matter, we don't know what is there. It's the physical anatomy of the body. But where are thoughts coming from? A person in front of us dies, he's dead. We bury him, cremate him, that there is nothing left. Why, the brain is still there, everything is still there. There's no change in the physical structure of the physical body. Then what has gone away? Where's life gone? If a person doesn't have life, how can he think? So life and thinking appears to be very synonymous in a way that thinking in the mind is creating our experience of life. The barrier to examining the mind is our attention is continuously on the created universe outside and we are wondering whether how it was created, but not going back to study, can the mind create it? Can it be a dreamlike experience? To do that, to examine the mind per se, with nothing else, you have to do only two things. One, don't have the physical body. Secondly, don't have sense perceptions. Remove them, you'll know the mind. And do you have to die to get this, to remove the body and to remove sense perceptions? Does the body have to die? Not at all. You can pretend you are dead. How about that? But pretend very strongly, in a very systematic way. Systematic ways to see if our attention, operating through sense perceptions, 
is getting all the knowledge of a created universe. Let's withdraw our attention from the created universe and put it on what we realize is our self, not the body, not the senses, not the mind. Life. If we want to examine what our life is, what makes us conscious at all, what makes us alive at all, then we should be able to perform a little trick on ourselves by putting all our attention inside the head, not outside. Where exactly do we put our attention? Where we think we are as thinking beings. Those who are thinking, we have to put attention there. Not anywhere. We have two eyes. Supposing we had one eye, all of us, we would not have had space in front of us. The concept of space has come because of two eyes. If supposing we had one ear, they would have no idea of direction at all. Did he know that? Why we have two eyes and why we have two ears? To create space and direction. And we have something else inside which creates the flow of time. That's our mind. If we are putting our attention within ourselves, what happens? Not only we put attention on what is happening inside, inside, behind the eyes, but at that point in the eyes, we are in spite of two eyes, we are seeing a single image outside. You know, you go to a movie, 3D movie, they give you glasses to wear. They used to give green and red glasses and the movie was shot in two colors. They were two different pictures, taken with the cameras at the same distance as the two eyes. These two eyes are not seeing the same thing. The two eyes are seeing two different pictures. We are seeing one. Where is the combination taking place? If you carefully examine, I, I give simple examples to people, that when you are looking at a distance, and you place your finger in front of you, you see two fingers. One is generally more prominent than the other, which, your, which is your prominent eye. If you look at the finger and join it together, you have done something to the eyes to come here, the rest of it gets blurred into two pictures. That means the eyes are seeing two pictures. There's a combination that we are doing. Where are we actually seeing one image? We are seeing behind the eyes, in the center of the brain, exactly in the center. Anatomy, if you say the anatomy of the head, it's exactly the point which is the, where the pituitary body hangs and the medulla oblongata, where the pineal gland is just on the side touching the pituitary gland. No wonder they say the pineal gland runs all our hormones in the body. All thought processes are coming from there. I had an experience with a brain surgeon who had done more than 1,000 brain surgeries, and he came to India to treat a patient, a VIP who had come from another country, who had an accident, car accident, and was in coma. So we asked him, he's unconscious. What makes one conscious? And that eminent doctor said, the surgeon, he said, I have done thousands of surgeries on the brain. We have no answer where consciousness comes from. But we do know that if we put a laser beam on the pineal gland, right at the center of the head, the man becomes unconscious. Therefore, we know the seat of consciousness in the human body, but we don't know how it comes and where it goes when a person dies. At least it is known. Now, if you examine only by contemplation, if I am seeing two things, where am I combining? Same spot. If you want to know where am I thinking from? Same spot. How easy it is to know that right in the center is where you think from. Not only think, right in the center where you imagine from. You can close your eyes, imagine anything. Imagine you are sitting on a chair. 
where are you sitting well not a picture if you make a picture of yourself inside you are sitting in front where are you watching the picture from the center of the head so very well look at it place supposing people do meditation in meditation they say let's go to third eye center where is the third eye and why is it called third eye is called third eye because these two eyes don't see the third eye sees where it combines the two pictures that's why the third eye is very important we are seeing from there a big visual experience of the main sense perception is taking place at third eye we don't have to find it we are there if you close your eyes and say if i am just a point of consciousness where am i automatically you will be at third eye said you are there in the wakeful state not every state only in human wakeful state when we are seeing this world and close our eyes we are in the third eye said we are not seeing ourselves there we are we are there so that is why people make a big mistake in meditation at third eye center they start locating where is the third eye and they start saying am i sitting there can i watch myself too no, you are not watching you should watch what is the space in front of you you should watch what is around you to make it very simple i can tell you how to look at the third eye center your two eyes draw straight lines behind the eyes two straight lines going back to the head draw a straight line between your ears these two straight lines will cross that one straight line that middle part is like a bench you are sitting there that's the third eye center good meditation is when you believe imagine you are there and put your attention there what will happen if you put your attention there and concentrate as think only what is happening there nowhere else and not think what happened before not remembering other things that happened outside no only think of what is happening there can i see what i can see there can i get up there can i dance there can i sing there can i do all my activities there in imagination if you do that your attention is being pulled there after some time you'll see you do not know where your physical hands are you won't know where your physical feet are you won't know later if you continue where your arms and legs have gone you you wonder you say where are they gone and you open your eyes you, the physical body is there you are really losing awareness of the physical body by putting attention and concentrating it inside this is not something unusual we are doing it all the time you go to a orchestra so many instruments are playing you say i like the drums and concentrate your attention on the drums the drums become louder and other instruments become weak nothing has changed there your attention has the capacity to concentrate on one and become unaware of the rest and that's the big power and that power is used if we concentrate at the center you become unaware of this body with some practice you can be completely unaware of the body and be fully aware of yourself with the sense perceptions intact when we imagine ourselves supposing you were to all imagine you are come up and stood near me next on this stage not difficult it's just an imagination and your imaginary self is here but your body is there how can you imagine you are here it's just a act of imagination because imagination is merely using your attention at a particular point you putting your attention here part of your attention has come here most of it is sitting there what would happen if you placed more than 50% of your attention in coming and standing next to me do you know what will happen if you try put your attention standing next to me this will become real that will become unreal that is the reality of a physical being it's all sense perceptions through attention when we do this exercise 
of placing your attention inside the third eye center where we are at the wakeful state, we can become unaware of the physical body and realize that sense perceptions are not only still there, they are more enhanced than you ever saw before. This power of imagination is not as imaginary as we think. It's imaginary so long as our attention, bulk of attention, is in the physical body. Our attention is spread all over the physical body and through the physical body in the physical universe. That's the only thing that's keeping us away from using imagination to turn it into something more real than this. Supposing you have weak eyes, like I have weak eyes, we have to use glasses to read at my age, you know. When I read a newspaper in my imagination, I have 20-20 vision. I can hear things very clearly, no hearing aid is needed. Even at my age, the inside sense perceptions are always very sharp. The, the fact that they are weak is because they are covered with physical body. Sense perceptions are not part of physical body. We think they are. Why? Because we take the physical body to be the only reality. And the other is all imagination. Just a function of the mind. But try this experiment. How sense perceptions can be separated by becoming unaware of the body through this kind of meditation. Anybody can do it and validate that there is something in, in us which functions independently of the physical body. But we are using it through the physical body and never separate it. That can be done. What is the advantage of doing it? The advantage is a knowledge of the structure of our consciousness. We are now examining the anatomy of our consciousness. That consciousness is operating not directly from this brain, but is partly operating in sense perceptions, the five sense perceptions, independently of this body. We can imagine we are flying. Can we really fly? This body cannot fly, except an airplane. But the inner body can. What's the difference between that imaginary body which can become real if we become unaware of this body? The difference is only one. This has matter, atoms, molecules in it. That doesn't. The rest is the same. This body provides sense perceptions because of the inner body. And that can be separated for experience, not by dying, by dying while living. That's why they say, the secret of discovering the truth about yourself is die while living. That means just withdraw attention. This is like pretending to be dead. A famous Rishi, Maharishi Raman in India actually discovered this by pretending to die. He thought he was very ill, he was going to die. And then he said, what will happen when I die? Then he pretended he was dead and stopped breathing. I'll hold my say, rigor mortis has set in my body. I'll stretch my body like that. He said, I'm feeling so strong inside. My sense perceptions are still there. How am I dead? The beginning of his spiritual career. Anybody can try that. So once you find out that sense perceptions can work independently and they function like a body. We sometimes call it the astral body, ethereal body, sensory system body no matter what name you give it, but it can be very easily achieved by simple practice of placing your attention behind the eyes, third eye center. But that does not answer my original question. Do we have free will? For that, you have to go to one more step. Next step is to place your attention in the third eye center of the inner body. Inner body also has the same form. That's why it's used to fitting into this body. If you now meditate after becoming unaware of the body and meditate in the head behind the eyes of the inner body, you will become gradually unaware of the sense perceptions also. Then what happens? You discover your mind. 
first time you will know what your mind is which you never knew till now you thought it's just a thinking process going on because you are alive you will see the mind is nothing but another body of yours just a cover upon life it's a cover upon your own self real self yes using it what is it doing it has no sense perception because we have left it behind no physical body we left it behind in awareness only it's still there but it's just meditating when we discover our mind we discover everything about destiny we discover all our destiny is made by us at our mind state not anywhere else it's a wonderful experience to see that what we thought was our karma our life good and bad was merely picking up a simple causal dvd and just playing it and that's our life we played it at the astral sensory level and then we played it at this level to enhance its beauty to enhance its reality when you discover your mind what what is it doing basically right now it's a thinking machine but a good thinking machine it thinks all the time never stops if it stops it will die hi heartbeat is say is like the heartbeat of the body if it stops it will die if the thinking stops mind dies thinking never stops but how is it how does it start thinking what are what are the essential nature of thought when you examine that you discover that the very first structure to place thoughts is the creation of time and space no thought can take place if there is no time and space all thoughts are in time and in space now scientists say time time space is just one one thing is just the different ordinates of that one space time there you discover the disc- how the space time is being created and how thoughts are being placed on it just because you want to play on a chosen destiny of your choice if we say over here do we have free will we can't answer this question there you will say we with some higher power were able to pick up a life in the form of something that we played out like we are playing here and it was picked up out of infinite number of opportunities that we had which one to pick up why did we pick up the kind of life we are leading many people tell me didn't we weren't we wise enough to pick up something better we must be very stupid people there and with all the ups and downs of life that we picked up no we were very intelligent when we picked up our life the reason was first of all we knew it's a created reality and that's where the answer will come that the materialists are wrong and the idealists who said that we are creating reality were right personal validation not believing anybody and not going to religion to believe something personal validation that is the mind that creates everything and you can create anything you want from there not here here we are playing out something when you start playing a dvd you can't change the middle you have to change the dvd itself and put a new one you can do that from that state imagine the flexibility that you get just by two steps of meditation in the meditation workshop we have i guide people it's not very difficult it's very simple all i'm saying is withdraw your attention to the center of this head to the center of the inner head that's all if you are interested have the determination to use your attention inside you'll get it but it doesn't answer the first part of my question which was if god 
knows everything. How can then you choose, even at that level, your destiny? Did, did you consult God? Well, for that you have to go another step. These two steps are not enough to get an answer. All you have found is that you are a living force using a mind. Does the living force also require time and space? Or only mind require time and space? You'll find living force doesn't need time and space. So we give a different name to the living force. What do we call it? Soul. We say we have a soul and a mind. Soul is the living force that makes us alive, makes us conscious. Mind is what creates space and time, creates destiny, creates experiences here. Creates all sensory experiences here. Now, if you want to know with, whether we consulted God or not, to pick up our DVD, one more step. Not a different one. The astral sensory body was like the shape of this body. By usage. We have been using that in this body. We did use different forms of bodies also. Angels, animals, insects, lot of things. But this practice is being done in a human body where we think we have free will, where we can seek to do these things. Therefore, it looks like a human body. Mind does not look like a human body. Mind has combined the sense perceptions into one perception that includes all sense perceptions. The mind has the capacity to perceive directly, not I'm touching this, hearing this, seeing this, everything is together. You can alternate. You won't know the distinction between seeing and hearing. It looks like you can see sound and hear light. The perception by the mind is very huge. It creates capacity. Therefore, when you go meditate, it still gives you like you have a form because of space-time. You have a form. What kind of form? Just a form. Sometimes people draw a picture of the physical body, very clear, said arms, feet, legs. Then they draw a picture of the astral body, a little bigger, to overlap this one. Then they draw the picture of the causal body of just a little oblong. Sometimes this is just a piece of light in the form. It's just a consciousness operating to create time space and creating this experience. Since it has no form like the human form, it thinks from its own center. Next step, place your attention, still working with the mind, place the mental attention in the center of the causal body. It doesn't work. Sorry. People have tried. It doesn't work. Because you can't cross something like a mind by using the mind. Attention is a function of mind. Therefore, by putting attention anywhere, you can't cross it. You are just using more mind. All these experiences that I am telling, including this physical experience, including astral sensory experience, including experience of the mind by itself, all mental exercises, all created by the mind. Now you want to find how the mind can pick up something, how life, soul does something. You can't use the mind for that. That is why there's a big limitation. It's a huge limitation. There's a barrier. The mind cannot escape itself. It can only find more about itself. And that's what's going on. To go beyond that, you have to use something that is non-mental. Let's go to that. Something non-mental should be going on, not there or higher, here. It should be visible here. Yeah, there are some things that are non-mental right here. Things that do not need space and time. Things that do not need time need any thinking. I'll give you three examples. First one, intuition. Intuitive knowledge, intuitive feeling comes not from the mind. Very often people have intuitive feeling, what they call gut feeling. 
I have a gut feeling this is going to happen. Mind says no, it cannot. Gut feeling says it can. Mind's answer is in time. Gut feeling is without time. It just comes spontaneously. It's happening here. We all have intuitive knowledge coming to us from time to time. We ignore it. We give preference to the mind. It appears that the gut feeling is coming from a hidden source behind the mind. Mind is in front, so we listen to the mind. We think mind is superior. That we have put wisdom into the mind. It's not in the mind. Intuition is more wise. If you were to study exactly how mind thinks, where it picks up its thought from, what is the conscious and subconscious areas of the mind, where is memory stored, what role the DNA molecule carrying all memories of all past lives carries. Study deeply, you will find the memory that is available to the mind to think is very limited. It's mostly data in front of it. Memory is very poor. It can't remember what happened a thousand years ago or a million years ago when it was just an amoeba. DNA molecules coming all the way. So that is why the mind's capacity to make decisions is very limited. Today we make a decision, tomorrow we say, oh, I, I didn't know about that, I forgot about that. It was the wrong decision I took. Mostly we make wrong decisions because of in inadequate data. Where does intuition pick up information from? Intuition picks up the timeless information from everything, from the whole background. Even what we are not remembering, intuition picks up that data. It's a very big thing. Okay, another example. More important, love. When you love somebody, it doesn't take time. It's instant. Love is instant. Not attachment. That takes time. Attachment is mind. Love is soul. It's beyond mind. Third example I can give you. Just a look at the flower. Beautiful. I didn't examine it to study. If I study why are they beautiful? Oh, this is red flower. This is this color. This is a beautiful vase, vase, beautiful things. That's mind. But the impact of beauty? Soul. Non-space time. These three functions continuously being performed in us, in conscious state, are coming from a different source than the mind. These are the three that take us beyond the mind. Not mental effort. That is why they say, the real truth to find who you are is effortless. Because all, all effort is mind. Well, we are all using the mind for everything, including understanding what is effortless. I remember a friend of mine writing to me, saying, I have discovered effort does not give you the real answer to yourself, what you self is. Effort will confine you to your mind. Because all effort is mental. You have to say, I am going to do this. I am going to do this. I am going to make an effort. The I is the face. The ego is the face of the mind. That's why you never get the discovery of your own self by any effort. He wrote to me, very nice letter, describing how effort does not solve the problem. The last line was very interesting in his letter. Last line is, now I'm going to try very hard on the effortless method. <laughs> Mind again. You can't get out of it. Why can't we get out of it? Because we do not know where love comes from. We have mixed up our knowing about love Mix it up with attachments. Don't forget, what is attachment? Attachment is liking something so much that you say, I love this, I love you, I love that person. I is as strong as the one you are loving. Two, when somebody, you fall in love with somebody, do you think of I? Not really. That's the only time I have seen in life that the eye is placed back when you fall in love. 
the lover takes place if you fall in love with somebody the beloved takes place of the i automatically therefore true spiritual discovery of your soul is only through love joy beauty intuition secret but where will you find this love how will you find can you find it again effort try to find it is effort you can't find it sorry but you can do one thing with your mind you can seek that's a very big word seek this is seek and you will find seeking is different from searching by the way search with your mind seek with your soul it's an intuitive seeking when you seek everybody wants to be loved everybody wants to love why is that because we are alive with a soul the mere fact we have a soul makes us desirous seekers of love now i want to tell you what is the role of a human being we call a perfect living master what is the definition of a perfect living master we call a human being who has transcended his mind and has awareness of his soul at all times not sometimes during meditation a person who has transcended the mind has actual living in a state of being of our awareness where these things are is reality love beauty joy bliss whatever names you give it and his awareness transcends the division that we have amongst ourselves which is all done by the mind remember mind divides mind's method of discovery is called analysis it analyzes everything how do you analyze split the side then you analyze a little child wants to understand a toy want to break it to see how it works and we also do the same thing our whole division even division into the many has been created by the mind you will discover that the soul intuitive power unites synthesizes not analyzes big difference there are human beings are they real no they are our projection also if everything is projected by us we project a human being if we discover that everything is being created by our mind all of us are being created by our own minds and we see the whole world just created by our mind and the mind is the creator creative power of this universe everything in it is created by the mind we create a human being in our experience who is perfect because perfection comes by not staying within the bounds of the mind i will explain why that is so the mind has certain functions through which it thinks the thinking process creates doubt skepticism is necessary it is designed to alert us alarm us don't be carried away by anything people say that's called doubt skepticism doubt leads to fear if you have no doubt you never be afraid fear is coming from doubt when you are uncertain doubtful skeptic you are afraid this may happen i am not sure lack of certainty comes if you transcend your mind uncertainty and doubt and fear disappear are there such human beings who have no fear no doubt and are living in a state of awareness where they can intuitively know everything have, can we have the power to project them yes we do how do they appear if we can't we can't know them because if they are human being they should be just like us 
we call such human beings and they exist we call these human beings perfect because imperfection is in the mind and they transcend the mind and live in that life they have no uncertainties at all if you come across such a person and you talk to them they talk with certainty about whatever they know nothing is maybes in their language no perhaps is it maybes because they are not talking from surmises or from learnedness they are talking from awareness direct awareness that is why we call such people perfect they are alive if they are dead we can't talk to them we can talk to a mind about dead people we can imagine that we are talking to them but you can't talk alive like we are talking to each other now they who are living persons why do we call them masters because they come in respond to our seeking and are able to teach us how to be exactly like them where do they exist do they exist in the himalayas in the higher mountains or something i have been to those mountains i got jobs there to do the himalayas for a long time I I saw many masters. None of them knew anybody in America or other places. Then we don't deal with any of them. Here our mind is making up. I have contact with ascended masters. I have contact with so many. You can make up any master you like in the mind. They are all mental game. The truth is different. When your seeking is strong, seeking what? many people come to me and say we know we are seeking something we are not sure what it is how can you be seeking if you don't know what you are seeking no we are seeking something is missing but we don't know what it is why don't you know because you are trying to use the mind to find something you are trying to search where seeking is taking place you can't find that searching is a mental activity searching is on the data available to you seeking is something that is not available that is why seeking is considered different seeking is from the soul when seeking becomes strong it's a very strong longing you don't even discover what you're seeking till something happens in life and you say that's what i was seeking and one of those things that happens is when a response to your seeking comes from a human being whom we call a perfect living master just a human being there is no difference between that human being and ourselves born like us dies like us fall sick like us eat food like us everything is life is like us a destiny like us he's not a superhuman guy a perfect living master is a response to our seeking what does he do loves us with pure love that which strikes our soul his connection with the seeker is at the level of the soul not the mind you can argue with him mentally as much as you like you can discuss things he'll discuss like any other man any other human being with his mind but what is affecting us is his pure love not attachment what is the difference between the love we experience with such a person and the love we experience normally with friends we are so mixed up in our attachment and love the definition of these two words that our so called love becomes conditional i love you so much what did you do for me and eh, that's not love that's that's an ego game it's an ego game i did this what did you do as if it is a business transaction when love comes you forget yourself the lover the beloved is there the love of a perfect living master is absolutely unconditional non judgmental it's not based on what you do not based on your behavior not based on your life not based on anything such a person's awareness is already aware that you are in a trap of your mind and is trying to come to 
take you beyond the mind. You called for him by your seeking. Therefore, he has appeared. In India, they say, when a disciple is ready, a master appears. They never say, when you are ready, you can find one. Because when you try to find, it's a mind. People try to find for their life. At the end, the master appears, which they were never finding. Pure coincidence, pure chance, pure circumstance. I'm glad there are coincidences. That's a good method to appear. By coincidence, such a human being appears, but of seeking is that strong. When we are ready, he appears. That's what they say. What does he do? He becomes a friend. So that we can experience love. And so many people, my friends and I, have experienced with our master, you see my master's picture here, we have experienced a love that is totally unconditional. No condition whatsoever. Such a person will love you if you love him. Such a person, if you are seeking, will love you if you don't love him. Such a person, if you are a seeker, will love you if you hate him. Such a person will love you if you kill him. That's the kind of love of a perfect living master. Very rare. I know they are very rare people that appear in this life. But they do appear with their seekers. It's a design we have made ourselves at a spiritual level. We don't know it. because We don't know our spiritual level at all. We are living in a world of mind, three worlds, physical, sensory, causal, causal because everything is caused from there, all mental worlds we are living in. And here our seeking is beyond that. That's rare seeking, by the way. We don't seek that normally. We seek some relief from our problems here. I am in pain, please help me. I am poor, please get me some more money. I am homeless, find me a home, find me some food, get me some more cash, get me some more of this, more of this. All here. That's what we seek. Very few seek to know who they are. Very few seek the ultimate truth of existence and of your own nature, who you are existing here. Why? Basic questions are not answered by the mind. Why did we come here in the first place? Somebody asked me once, if we were so happy in our true home, they call such Khand, true home, what are the need to come here? And when I gave an answer, he was shocked. I said, we never left our true home. We are right there. If we leave it, everything will dissolve. Our true home is totality of consciousness, the creative power that you give different names. You give name, God, Creator. If you personify, then we bring them at a lower level. You don't personify, we take it to the top level, totality of consciousness from where every level has been born, within us. Where is this totality of consciousness? Obviously, it can't be outside the created part. It's within the creative power. The self, the ultimate self is the creative power. When you discover that, that you are actually in the highest form, only one division was made with space and time. There is only one. Nothing else exists. All existence comes from there. And you are part of that existence at all times. Then how can you say that God is separate from you? There is no separation at all. But you can't say that today here. You can say it if you can cross the boundary of the mind and discover you are not the body. It's just a costume you are wearing for an experience. You are not the mind. It's a costume you are wearing to create space and time and experience a different way. Are you a soul? Unit of consciousness? Yes. But is that also a costume? That. Now that requires a still higher level. One more level. When you cross the mind, you discover that you are not body, you are not in time and space, it's all created. And you are a soul, life force that gives you life, that makes everything alive, that makes your mind alive. 
makes your senses alive, makes your body alive, makes the whole world alive. That's your soul. How many souls are there? Trillions of souls. I was told that there is a bacteria in everybody's belly here. Good bacteria and bad, bad bacteria. They send messages to us, to our brain. They are living beings. Each has a soul. About three trillion we all carry. And imagine how many souls there are existing. Infinite number. Then which soul is controlling all this? The truth is there is only one soul. All this division is within that one soul. It's experience. And for that discovery, one more step. And perfect living masters of that order, who are experiencing that oneness at all times, they appear in our life when we are seeking that kind of oneness. Saying we are one means nothing. Experiencing is very different. Then you experience everybody is just part of the same game, big game going on. All created from the same source. Those perfect living masters that come from that state, there is no difference in, in their bodies and in their life. They live like us. Their awareness is that level. Their awareness is that level at all times. Not sometimes that they can raise their awareness. When we do experiments like I am suggesting, when we do meditation like I am suggesting, go within, we can only experience one reality at one time. Like I said, when you go to sleep, dream becomes a reality. Wake up, dream becomes unreal and this becomes, wakeful state becomes reality. When we go to the astral sensory plane and become unaware of this physical body, that becomes the only reality. And we know that the, the re only reality was what created the physical reality. We come to know that. It was like a dream. When we go to causal plane, we discover that's the only reality. The others were just created. At one time, we only have experience of one reality. When we discover the soul, we discover soul was the only real thing. Everything was created from the power of the soul. Only reality. But when we go to the top, we discover all realities were created and all realities are one. And that experience holds your experience of all realities at the same time. Only at the top. That is why there are very few perfect living masters. My master used to say, even in the best of times, the number of perfect living masters can be counted on the fingers of the two hands. It does not mean there will be only one. There can be many because the masters appear where the seekers are. The seekers of that ultimate reality. They, wherever there are seekers who want to go to the ultimate reality in their life, by coincidence, master will appear. I've watched all my life this happening in every country of the world I've seen. It's not any particular area. Masters exist. And perfect living masters exist where there is that kind of seeking going on. They have come for the seekers. When you go there, you discover who is a master? Yourself. Your own self. There is only one. If there is only one, how can there be somebody else? It is the own self that has made arrangements to be a master in this physical world. That discovery is the best one. That the whole thing was only one consciousness that created the whole thing. And this is amazing that we talk about it. We discuss these things. And they are all lying within ourselves. But we don't go with it. We spend all our time even examining these things outside. We go to temples, churches, synagogues, mosques, religious places to find this truth. All built by us. What about this one? This church? This temple? This mosque? Our head? Don't you think it's good enough? All the truth is inside here. I tell you, God is inside. There's nothing outside. It's all being created from inside. Go within. Check it out. Some people might think I'm telling some fairy tales. Maybe I'm making up a good story. Yeah, part, of, part of it is a good story, I must tell you. 
part of it is being described in physical terms. You can't really describe it. Can you imagine, for example, I'm giving an example of how we cannot describe. Can you imagine there's a huge big mansion, beautiful place. It is located in zero time and zero space. Nobody can imagine it. It exists, but cannot be imagined. Imagination is limited to the, ment to the mental space-time concept. It's limited to thinking. But life is not thinking. It's more than that. Go within and check it out for yourself. I am just suggesting from a small experience I have had with this gentleman whose picture you see here, that what he, I call him a perfectly living master. Because what he promised, he delivered. I've had many masters, so many teachers in my life. They teach, they don't deliver. If your thinking is only how to expand your mind, how to think better, how to lead a better life, there are a lot of teachers who can do that. And they are doing it. It's a very useful thing. But if you want to know the ultimate truth, lies within yourself. What will pull you beyond the mind is the power of love. And that is what a perfectly master comes for. To draw you above the mind with the power of love. A love that you never experienced before. No judgment, no condition. That's the kind of love that pulls you beyond. You can experience it right from here, from the physical body. It comes up like that. So that's the secret. If your seeking is less than that, many masters will come. It does not mean that a perfectly master comes into your life automatically. When your seeking itself is not clear, you're searching for something, its masters will come according to your search, according to your seeking. When the seeking goes beyond the mental seeking, then of course, perfectly master appears automatically. I have spent enough time traveling around the world and watching this show going on, how perfect masters have appeared, the lives of those who sought the ultimate truth. I have a feeling that many of you here are searching that ultimate truth. That's why I'm sharing all these experiences with you. What I'm sharing, not from any books, but from experience with that man. Hazur Maharaj Baba Savan Singh, my master, perfectly master, great master. We call him great master. Very happy to see all of you again. And you come from many places, far off places. I appreciate your coming. It makes me feel very good when I meet my friends, always. So much love and devotion, I notice. Amazing. It's wonderful. So thank you very much for coming. We'll have a break now. You can enjoy some lunch. There is something lying there I can notice. <laughs> so we have given you enough food for thought. <laughs> little bit for your soul and now that's for your body. Thank you very much. See you at about 3 o'clock again.